So, Joe, first cow, what did you think? Well, a couple of things to say before we sort of get into the review, and that is that, first of all, I watched the film some weeks ago and I was going to re-watch it for the podcast and didn't. So some of my comments will be a bit more general rather than specific. And the other thing was that I wanted to... I wanted to start really by talking a bit about Meek's Cutoff, one of her earlier films, and uh, that will become clear why in a moment. But there is a, there is a kind of a, a philosophy within a certain type of cinema, um, and the slow cinema, so called, sort of comes out of this philosophy that says that the the sort of hyperactive conventions of mainstream cinema obscures one of cinema's most potent effects, and that is that it has the unique ability to convey and allow us to re-experience lived time, you know, the texture and real feel and experience of time. And one of the reasons I really admire Meek's Cutoff is that Kelly Reichardt combines that ambition with a really stark and effective thriller. And so unlike a filmmaker like, for example, Simon Lang, who is interested almost exclusively in, in conveying the, the texture of time and less so the conventions of storytelling, Kelly Reichardt combines the two in what I think is a really effective way. And although I can be fascinated by what you might call the more pure slow cinema, I really admire her skill as a storyteller. And the reason I start with that is because I am... I am temperamentally drawn towards that kind of stark asceticism. And I think that really shows up what is most bold and interesting about First Cow. And that is how gentle and slight it is. And I think that's quite bold, quite a bold thing to do on the face of it, because it risks seeming inconsequential, almost something you could sort of too slight to really pay much attention to. And I think actually that's a mark of the film's maturity. It has a real gentleness to it, but it's, a very, it's not overly concerned with its legacy. And it's not overly concerned with the fact that you could say the film risks undermining Kelly Reichardt's, the sort of gravity of her reputation as a formalist, you know, because she could have just banked that really and kept making films in that mold. And I love them because I'm really drawn to that kind of cinema. But instead, she makes this very small, almost quaint film that is quite curious, really, within her career. Um, but judged on its own terms, I think it's a, a very successful and diverting, slight and interesting film but I think it's even more interesting when considered in the context of her broader career and contemporary American cinema more generally. Um, I think when I talk about its, its maturity, I think that can likewise be seen in its relationship to allegory, because on the one hand, this does present itself as an, as an allegory for American capitalism and expansionism, but it's very balanced and it's certainly not a screed because within this film, capitalism is very useful and it gives these men opportunities to make their lives better i mean eventually it kills them but this is this is a fault of human nature it's not a fault inherent in the system and at the same time it's it's a very specific and personal story about a friendship and in fact the story when described in sort of bare bones terms again sort of straddles that border between almost being ridiculous and being quite uh, provocative and innovative because the story is of two men who become friends and still milk from someone else's cow to make their cakes better, you know, and that's almost absurd, but it's yeah. really quite potent and powerful in, on its own terms. Um, I think tonally it's, it's, it is very gentle, as I say, but it's also quite strange. There are moments like the moment where he first finds uh, him hidden in the bushes, naked. And th that's, that's kind of almost an unnerving sort of film. And it reminded me a bit of Uncle Bun Me, who can recall his past lives tonally, but also, and very knowingly, I think, the Jim Jarmusch film, Dead Man. Like Dead Man, it's very uh, haunting and, it, and elliptical. And of course, you have Gary Farmer in both films in very prominent roles. And I think this, this film calls back to that Jim Jarmusch film very explicitly, I think. 
So tonally, I thought it was very interesting. I think it's a very interesting film within the context of Kelly Reichardt's career more broadly. And I found it, I found it really uh, compelling and, and funny. And there were moments that there were things like uh, when he goes hunting for mushrooms at one point. And I, there's something almost alarming about seeing someone just gather what they need and then leave. And there were mushrooms everywhere and he could have just carried on gathering them, you know? And, it, and I think it very carefully but quietly conveyed another time, a time of plenty, where the idea of, you know, hoarding things before someone else gets them is, not, is, is only just sort of burgeoning, you know? Um, so I really liked it. And, it. and I should say as well that I went to see it I went to see it on a, I think it was either a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon with a really good friend at the BFI. And I think those are like perfect conditions to see a film like this. Um, so it was a real pleasure to watch. Are you, are you saying it was different than her other films? Cause I haven't, this is the first uh, film I've seen that, that she's done. Are, are you saying it's different than her other films in terms of the slow cinema? Yes, very different. As I say, Meek's cutoff has a, has a kind of stark asceticism, which is almost quite uh, quite grave and detached and uh, almost forbidding. Whereas this is far, far more gentle and quiet and low key. It, that, that's so interesting because, of course, I don't know the rest of her work at all, but the first point that I was going to make is related I've written down slow cinema because I think this film is genius for that that it is I think we did discuss slow cinema once before didn't we on the podcast I think it was in the context of for the time being and one thing that I really liked about that film is how in in a in a very slow film where the sound is really prominent it, if it's successful, a slow film can make you really mindful of every every noise, every little creak um, and crack, and you know bird sound and and um, and I thought this this film was really successful in that it was always very very gentle but very slow very kind of and and it and it put in it put me in a very mindful state where I became right from early on when he's picking the mushrooms which is one of the early scenes the the you know you you kind of feel the texture of the mushroom and hear the, the sound you know the texture of the mushroom by the sound of of it breaking as he breaks it off and you know and all the way through the film I was I was kind of hyper aware of the sound of the sa the sounds of nature but then you know the human made sounds as well I mean the, the King Lou's voice I thought was incredible it's like re you'd want that guy to read your stories at night when you know going to bed there was something really beautiful about the tone of voice and and something really reassuring um about it so you know I thought this film kind of ticks the slow cinema box in the sense that it it does create that hypersensitivity to very small things you know it's very gentle it's very slow and and you notice the small things at the same time it's great storytelling mm. and and it's a re so it's a really because often slow cinema is you know, can be quite tedious to watch. Um, you know, Satan Tango, for example, is, you know, I find that hard work to watch, but it's rewarding, you know, but it's actually hard work w watching it. This was just a joy to watch from start to end. I, I kind of loved the story. And I thought, you know, at times the tension, the tension of kind of, are they gonna get caught? <laughs> You know, are, are, are they are they going to get um, you know found out? It it was almost unbearable at times. So it was you know, and I think this this is genius to create something that's so slow, so gentle, so delicate that but still kind of gripping. 
I just think it's fantastic cinema. And, you know, the other thing about the story, uh, the storytelling is the, the structure of the film. You know, it's, it's only about five minutes after it ended that I kind of connected the opening scene of, and realized that the opening scene was a was obviously you know at a later a much later period because the the cargo ship is you know contemporary and not of the time when the the rest of the film is set and the, the skeletons I it, I didn't initially realize when they lay asleep that you know that was the position in which they 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 died. And they're found all those years later. And I just thought that that structure was just really neat. And, you know, so to, to actually achieve those two things, the kind of slow mindfulness with great storytelling, I, I just thought was so impressive. And, you know, part of that, I think, is that you really experience the nature, you know, it's, it's you 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 know the textures and the 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 kind of temperature and the 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 moisture and you know i think it's it's fantastic for that the other thing is the food you know i, I it made me think a little bit of the film babette's feast in the sense that when you see babette's feast you want to eat after that you know it's it's like it 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 has that same you know, it makes you very sensitive to the food. And in this, the food is very simple, but because they're eating, you know, foraging stuff in the forest, these, these cakes made of milk, you know, are, and with the honey, they're like, you, you, you know that they're, they taste amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I just think that is great. You kind of taste it along with them. Um, I found the film really magical. And enchanting you know it was like a fairy tale at times and and in a way um cookie reminded me a little bit I mean, obviously it's a very different film but as lazaro in that film happy as lazaro you know he, he's he's a simple guy and he 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 loves you know making that he loves serving this stuff and you know it, it kind of made me think of that there was the the, the kind of musical box type music um made it really enchanting, uh, you know, in a really beautiful story. Incredible acting, you know, of everyone in the film, I think, but particularly the two main characters and the friendship between them. I just thought the chemistry was, was incredible. You know, although it was slow, it was, you know, it was just really interesting to watch. You know, even when it wasn't, when there wasn't tension, it was just always really compelling. And I was so impressed with that. And then, of course, you know, there is so many different levels of meaning in this in terms of, um, you know, capitalism and class. And, and I agree with you that it wasn't just a kind of critique of capitalism in the sense that, you know, these guys are really entrepreneurs and there's something beautiful about, you know, craft and making things, you know, being, being a craftsperson and being able to to make things and then exchanging them with other people, you know, and kind of making making money in the way that they did. Obviously, not the not the theft, but there's something kind of you know beautiful about that level of entrepreneurship. But of how it becomes corrupted, you know, capitalism almost is flawed within itself. In that there's something beautiful about making things and exchanging them, um, but that you know, it ends up in exploitation and kind of ownership. And, you know, I thought that was a, a really fantastic image of the cow shut in this little fenced off area. You know, the cow had been, the cow was kind of put into service and obviously on a, on a, a rope um, and wasn't completely free, but then it, it had to be fenced in, you know, and that was the saying so much really. And, so I thought that was really interesting. You know, the, there's, a, there's a lot about economics in this film. I just thought it was fascinating how in such a simple film with, you know, a kind of fairy tale quality to it that you could kind of infer so much in such simple ways. So, you know, I was enchanted by it and really impressed. And I saw it on a TV, which, you know, actually... 
this is a film that needs to be seen on a big screen, not least because you need to, so many of the scenes are really dark. And I saw it in the daytime and although I had the blinds closed, there were times when I just really couldn't see. And I think even in the cinema, I imagine you wouldn't have been able to see everything. Um, and so I would, re you know, the sound became re becomes really important in those scenes. You kind of know what's going on from the sound. Um, but I think I would love to see this film again on a, on a big screen. I, I, I really, I was really impressed with this film. No, oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. In agreement then. I think, uh, you're right that the real, that the real, um, what distinguishes it is the combination of those qualities, you know, a, a real, uh, and genuine fascination with the, with the, um, capabilities of cinema and what it's potential to to you know um recreate experience in that way and make us mindful as you say but combining that with a really deft storytelling technique and this i wonder if i mean this is probably a broader conversation and but i wonder if there is something to be said for a particular type of mindset that and we've talked about this the other week a, a sense of elitism towards i the idea of storytelling as being somehow beneath uh a filmmaker who is who is more interested in more lofty things you know and that and that actually it takes a real kind of maturity and humility to say well there's a huge amount of pleasure and skill in in telling stories well you know it's not it's it's not something to be looked down upon it's incredibly difficult you know and you describe mm. this film as simple and it and you're right it has a very simple feel and I think that belies the fact that actually you know making a film like this work on a you know on a mechanical level in terms of like plot mechanics is is difficult you know and and to make it seem simple is just such a skill um and it's effortless in this film and it reminded me a bit i know you didn't like the film but it reminds me of the pelinesma one that i just thought was fantastic that um was called something useful and i think yeah. because that too had a kind of as an almost world weary humility and maturity to it you know like it's going to tell quite a simple story and just take pleasure in that you know and this I like that, uh, and sometimes I find that quite uh, an quite a necessary antidote to the more intentionally forbidding, provocative, difficult cinema. That you know, I, uh, there is a time for that and a time and a place for that kind of cinema. And some of it I can find really fascinating and stimulating. But sometimes it's nice to just find a filmmaker who treats all of that a, a little more, a little with a little more maturity. You know? Yeah, I. I agree, actually, that um, I think it's it's harder to make slow cinema that has a great story than it is to make slow cinema. Yeah. In some ways, it's 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 too easy to make slow cinema, and I think it's probably too easy to make bad slow cinema. And actually, uh, the more I've got to know, you know, both you and I love Tarkovsky's work. Um, but the more I've watched Tarkovsky films over the years, I think there are some parts of the films and some, and some of the films that just don't work, that are just boring. And, you know, it, it, it's maybe kind of controversial <laughs> to say that, but, you know, I think this is an example of something that, of a film of, of how you can put great storytelling into incredible filmmaking as well, you know, and um, so I, I, you know, I, I agree with you that actually this is probably much more difficult than, 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 you know, what you might call a traditional slow, slow cinema. Film. I think it's a really good point you make that perhaps it's too easy to make slow cinema. Perhaps it's too easy. It's certainly too easy to make bad slow cinema. You know, it's it's too easy to you. It's so easy to parody. You know, because lots of those films border on parody anyway. Yeah, you know, static camera, very long takes, oblique yeah. storytelling, little dialogue, an ending that is so sort of. Do you know what I mean? It's the, the, the ingredients are just, they're all there, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking as we're speaking of uh, Bresson's uh, A Man Escaped, 
because that's like got a really exciting ending. It builds up to this really exciting ending, you know, and it and it's okay to kind of finish it off as a good story. There is, you know, it's a very Brasonian film and there is kind of repetition and we keep getting that same piece of music and him walking out of his cell down the stairs. And, and I love all that about the film, but there is a really good story through that film that kind of culminates in, you know, quite in, in a really enjoyable and entertaining ending. And yeah, I think it's an interesting point, isn't it? That, you know, I think there can be, there can, I don't think we're saying, are we, that, you know, every, that, that slow film without a good story is necessarily inferior. You know, I think, there are some incredible films that you might, you know, I think the, um, I could never remember the name of it, but the Chantal Ackerman film. Ah, Jeannie, Dil Jeannie Dillman. Yeah, I think that's, that's got very, although it's got quite a shocking <laughs> end to it, hasn't it? But that's, that's got very little story in it. But I just think that is incredible, that film. Yeah. You, I guess you would call that slow cinema. But it's yeah. just, you know, in incredible. So it's not that, I don't think we're saying that every, every, every slow cinema film. No, I think what it comes down to for me is, and no, you're right, there is certain slow cinema. I mean, you mentioned Satin Tango, which, you, you know, personally, I, I find that, I don't know what it is about that film. I just find it completely beguiling. I love it. And, but I think what, I think what's risky or what's potentially sort of dangerous uh, is that there is, there is perhaps a belief that the, the, the identifiable tropes of slow cinema are in and of themselves weighty, meaningful, and, you know, thought provoking. That, you know, those, those sort of tropes that we just listed, static camera work, long takes, you know, very little dialogue, that these things in and of themselves carry weight and heft and, and a kind of depth. And they don't, you know, you need to, you need to use those techniques for a reason. They need to be invested with a kind of a philosophy and a meaning that you bring yeah. to the film. They're, they're, they're tools, these techniques. And, you, you know, they're there to express something more fundamentally urgent. And I think too often there is no fundamental urgency. There's just a kind of proclivity towards the ready-made uh, heft that we attach to that what are now becoming almost cliched cinematic tropes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, it's interesting discussion. But yeah, so we both highly recommend this. Yeah, first Cow's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, what are we watching next? Next week uh, is a film called Kala Azar by Janice Raffa. Excellent. Looking forward to it.